The purpose of this series is to determine the best American male tennis player at any given point in the Open era. To signify which American male sat on top of the American men's tennis world, we award them the hypothetical championship belt. Here's the criteria I used in judging each of these players. Grand Slam titles, year-end rankings, popularity amongst fans, Davis Cup success, success on the American Junior Tour, and last but not least, head-to-head records. The series starts in 1968, as the tour finally agreed to allow professionals to compete in Grand Slams, and the Open Era officially began. Part 1, The Best Possible Start The Open Era began with three years of Aussie dominance. An aging legend by the name of Rod Laver won five of the first seven men's Grand Slam singles titles, and he and fellow countrymen Ken Rosewall and John Newcomb combined to win eight of the first 11 slams. Only two other men managed to win majors in those first three years. One was a Czechoslovakian man named Jan Kodis. He won a 1970 French Open that did not include any of the three Aussies in the draw. The other man forwent his prize money from his first Grand Slam title to maintain eligibility for the U.S. Davis Cup. He is the first recipient of the Best American Male Tennis Player belt. Arthur Ashe's accomplishments could fill the remainder of this series. He was a pioneer in advocating for both the game of tennis and social equality within the sport. He began playing at the age of seven and grew up at a time when African Americans were not traditionally allowed to play at or train at the traditional country clubs. Born in 1943, Ash grew up in segregated Richmond, Virginia, next to the city's largest blacks-only park, which was managed by his father, Arthur Sr. In 1958, he became the first African-American to play in the Maryland Boys Championships and the first African-American to win the National Junior Indoor Tennis title. He would win a tennis scholarship to attend UCLA and became the first African-American to represent the U.S. on the Davis Cup team, an international tennis competition. He was featured in Sports Illustrated's Faces in the Crowd in both 1960 and 1963, and in 1963 became the first African American ever selected to participate in the U.S. Davis Cup. He was also the first African American to win the NCAA individual, singles, and doubles titles in the same season, becoming one of only 15 men in history to win all three events in the same year. Ash was also the first American male success of the Open Era. From 1968 to 1974, he won two Grand Slam singles titles, made two other Grand Slam singles finals, and won the 1971 French Open men's doubles titles. He also led the U.S. Davis Cup team to -to -to back-to-back-to-back titles from 1968 to 1970. During the 1968 season, he won 10 of the 22 tournaments he entered, went 11-1 in Davis Cup matches, went 72-10 and overall on the year, and became the first African American to capture the U.S. Open. In 1968, at age 25, and still in the U.S. Army as a second lieutenant, Ash won the first U.S. Open. And he was the first and still only African-American man to win the tournament. And he's got it! It would change his life forever. As he said, you know, it gave him a platform. People now will listen to me. He's also the only black man in men's tennis history to win either Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, or the Australian Open. But you go back to 1968 and you look at what was happening in America um, from a civil rights perspective, from a humanitarian perspective, and then you see Arthur Ashe 
win and, and raise that trophy. You know, there's, there's no greater moment in history, I think, for us in tennis than that because it really started to transcend and transform how tennis was viewed in America. As this is the belt for the best American male tennis player of all time, let's also look at his records against his best American contemporaries. Look at his record against Stan Smith, one of the great players of the era. Ash went 10-6 and six in his career against Smith, and after dropping three of his first four occasions, won three straight matches between 1970 and 1972. Ash also carried a 6-1 and one record against Vitas Girolaitis, a 9-3 and three record against Roscoe Tanner, a 9-4 and four record against Charlie Purcell, and a 15-3 and three record against Robert Lutz. When it came to playing fellow American men, Ash always brought his A game, and more often than not, left the court as the champion. But of course, when telling the story of Arthur Ashe, his tennis accomplishments are only a piece of the equation. Outside of all of the firsts he accomplished on the court, he was a warrior for social justice off of it. If you happen to be black, uh, in these times, maybe not 50, 30 years ago, but in these times, 1968, it's really a mandate that you do something. You must. There are other athletes and other black leaders, period, who, who are using their, their positions of, of power and influence to, to wheel some practical progress. So I, it's just simply saying to myself, Arthur, uh, you must do something. You, you just cannot sit by and let the world go by. After being denied a visa to play the 1969 South African Open, Ash continued to apply and used his example to lead the U.S. government's charge against sanctioning South Africa's apartheid government. The country was subsequently expelled from Davis Cup competition in 1970, and in 1973 relented and granted him a visa to play. Ash played the events from 1973 to 1977, hoping his example would lead to change. However, in 1977, as South Africa's government policies continued, Ash resumed his boycott and swore to never play the event again. He was also arrested in both 1985 and 1992 while protesting for racial equality. And after years of mistreatment and undercompensation, Ash helped lead the charge to found the Association of Tennis Professionals, or what we now know simply as the ATP. He said it over and over again, if the tennis champions were all that I leave, I've left nothing. You know, that he wanted to leave a legacy and he wanted other athletes to, to take it as an, as an example. In 1974, as a way to recognize his work on behalf of the players, he was voted president of the newly formed ATP. Even after his time in tennis, Ash wrote columns for Time Magazine, The Washington Post, and served as a commentator for ABC. Later in his life, he founded the Arthur Ashe Foundation for the Defeat of AIDS, as well as the Arthur Ashe Institute of Urban Health. As a result of Ash's immense success, his legacy is cemented by his namesake stadium court in Flushing Meadows. He set the standard for so many of the American players that followed and is rightly treated as one of the greats of our game. When the world's greatest tennis players compete at the U.S. Open in Flushing Meadows, New York, this is the Mecca, the huge stadium where championships are won and lost. It's named for a tennis great who transcended the court and sport itself, Arthur Ashe. Now you may have noticed one man hasn't been mentioned thus far who certainly played a role in Arthur Ashe's story. He's the only American with a definitively winning record over Ashe, and their rivalry also extended off the court. That man, of course, is Jimmy Connors. Yes, Connors carried an 8-1 and one record over Ash. But given that this series starts at the beginning of the Open era, and given that the majority of Connors' success against Ash came in later in the 1970s, it feels only right that Arthur Ash is our first recipient of this belt. That being said, while Jimmy Connors failed to match Ash's grace, class, 
and humility on the court. The brash Midwesterner's 8-1 and one record over Ash certainly positioned him well to be our next recipient. Unfortunately for Connors, a trash-talking, audacious New Yorker by the name of John McEnroe was just as hungry to succeed Ash, and their rivalry launched American men's tennis to a place it had never been before. That rivalry, of course, is the topic of our next episode. Before we wrap today's podcast, want to give a huge shout out to Blue Claw Music and Thomas Ackley for their song America the Beautiful Hip Hop Track Remix, which we have used as the score throughout this podcast. Also want to say a big thank you to PBS for their extensive collection of sound bites. For more from the Blue Claw Music Group, for more from PBS, be sure to go check out all of their content which you can find on YouTube. That's part one of our series. Part two, things get interesting as fire matches up with ice. And we hope you'll keep listening. Thanks, everyone.